We now live in an age where information has become one of the world's leading commodities. A wise man once said that information is intelligence. Rapid access to information is essential if we're going to make intelligent decisions affecting our businesses and personal lives. Information also has become our single most important form of entertainment. Each day, billions of people around the world spend hours of their leisure time accessing information from various video, audio, text, and graphic sources. If we stop and think about it, the information age is giving us greater access to media than at any other time in the history of mankind. However, our voracious appetite for media far exceeds the delivery capacity of the existing telecommunications infrastructure. The information superhighways formed by today's satellite, cable, microwave, telephone, and fiber optic networks is much like any other transportation system. Only so many cars or trucks can fit onto any given highway, and these vehicles can only carry a finite amount of cargo. One obvious solution to this problem is to compress the contents of any shipment so that more units can fit in the limited space available. The compression of physical objects has been going on for some time now. Foodstuffs, for example, can be compressed by removing the liquid content. The cook merely has to add water in order to reconstitute the food item to its original state. The term UPS shippable also comes to mind. Many products are now shipped in a compressed format, in other words, unassembled, and the goods are decompressed or assembled at the receiving end. The concept of electronic compression was first used in computer systems to solve critical data storage problems. A single floppy disk like this can hold about 250,000 words of text. In the early days of personal computing, this capacity was sufficient for most applications. But as the ability and complexity of computers and peripheral devices has grown, so has the size of the data files that we need to store. To solve this problem, computer programs have been created, which convert data files into an equivalent shorthand format that preserves all essential information. Through compression, a file containing 500,000 words can now be contained on this same single floppy disk. To reuse this compressed file at any future date, the computer operator uses a special program to expand the file to its original format. In two-way communications networks, compression is used to reduce the amount of frequency bandwidth without substantially degrading the quality of the message. In order to understand the concept of bandwidth, we must first have a working knowledge of the term frequency. A frequency is defined as the number of times that an alternating current goes through a complete cycle in one second of time. One cycle per second also is called a Hertz, named after the 19th century radio pioneer Heinrich Hertz. 1,000 cycles per second is called a kilohertz, 1 million cycles per second a megahertz, and one billion cycles per second, a gigahertz. Every communications channel has a finite amount of frequency spectrum, or bandwidth, available. For example, a typical satellite channel bandwidth would be 36 megahertz wide. A single cable or broadcast TV channel bandwidth would be 6 megahertz wide. And a narrowband telephone channel, just a few kilohertz wide. Compression dramatically reduces the bandwidth transmission requirements so that multiple signals can be transmitted within the same space formerly required to send just one signal. All communication signals were formerly analog waves of electromagnetic energy which conveyed information by changing both the intensity or amplitude and the frequency of the waveform. During the past 10 years, however, narrowband communication systems such as telephone networks have been converting their transmission formats from analog to digital. 
through digitization, signals can be expressed as strings of zeros and ones, binary numbers which correspond to the off or zero and on or one logic states of computer circuitry. In digital sound transmission systems, audio pitch and intensity are expressed as a stream of binary digits or bits. A transmission rate of 1,000 bits is called a kilobit per second, while a transmission rate of 1 million bits is called a megabit per second. While analog audio transmissions are sent continuously in real time, digital audio transmissions are sent in bursts of pulses, which are then stored in the receiver's buffer circuit and released over time to maintain an uninterrupted flow. Digital transmissions offer several advantages over their analog counterparts. As analog signals pass through a system, they will pick up noise from each of the amplifiers in the communications chain. This can degrade the quality of the received signal. Digital processing converts the original message into a numerical form that is not susceptible to this kind of degradation. Each group of numbers or block within a digital transmission can be numerically checked at the receive end. Transmission errors can be detected and in some cases corrected or in other cases masked so that they are not perceived. Digital transmissions therefore have the ability to deliver a more faithful representation of the original signal. During the past decade, telephone companies the world over have been converting from analog to digital. The result? Higher signal quality and lower cost due to the reduction in signal bandwidth. Until fairly recently, it wasn't economical to transmit video in a digital format. A video image has about 1,000 times the amount of information contained in a telephone conversation. The computational power needed to transmit such a large volume of information simply wasn't available at an affordable price. The history of video compression and the history of CLI are linked together going back over a considerable period of time. The founders of, of compression labs uh, were some of the original cosine transform researchers and scientists, uh, and the company really grew up as a company doing video compression. Um, our initial business was in the was and is in the video conferencing area. Uh, we've progressed over a period of perhaps 10 years from systems that cost $100,000 and comprise an entire rack of equipment in order to get only one video channel to systems which can put uh, an entire video channel on uh, perhaps one or two cards. During the past two decades, however, the computational power of computers has doubled every two years while maintaining a cost that is equal to or even less than the cost of the previous generation. What's more, very large-scale integrated circuit chips are now available at an affordable price. These computer chips easily handle the complex process of digitizing and compressing video signals. Compression in itself, as far as the technology, has been known and has been around for 20 years, the DCT algorithm process. The uh, excitement is that the fantasy or the concept has now become technical reality. It allows uh, from multiple sources, you know, various programmers to deliver very efficiently to the end consumer a product in the best, uh, quickest manner. The technology of digital video compression is causing a dramatic decline in the operational costs for TV services. The result is an explosion in the number of new TV services coming our way. These include pay-per-view movies and sports events, educational TV services, and numerous narrowcast offerings that target the unique needs of small segments of the general population. The matter is that, that in order to have a niche program that was aimed, for example, at 1% of the audience, you have to have a huge audience available to make that economically feasible. If DBS, either Hughes, DirecTV, or ourselves, were to put on a program 
that were aimed at 1% of people who are interested in a certain subject, and we could get that 1% to go out and buy a dish, that's a million homes. For a typical cable system, it's 150 or 200 homes. It doesn't make economic sense. So DBS will really be the, make available the magazine rack of the airways. Moreover, digitally compressed, high-definition television pictures will be serving major American TV markets on UHF TV channels. HDTV video features at least twice the number of active lines offered by regular TV. These finer grained images have a sharpness that approaches the clarity of 35 millimeter film. The technology of HDTV already has advanced to the point that the movie studios are contemplating the direct transmission of movies to theaters. Best of all, direct broadcast satellites already use digital video compression techniques to transmit more than 100 channels of video through satellite capacity, which previously would have only handled 16 TV signals. The 1993 Satellite TV Convention held in Nashville, Tennessee, marks the end of one era and the beginning of another. The large dish boom of the 1980s is giving way to the tiny DBS antenna revolution of the 1990s. With the launch of America's first direct broadcast satellite, the tiny, inexpensive dish will become a reality for millions of American households. DirecTV will be the first high-powered digital broadcast system for the United States. We're using the new DBS frequency, and in April of 1994, we'll deliver about 150 channels to the entire United States to a small 18-inch satellite dish. How will digital video compression help you make the DBS revolution a reality for America? Digital compression really is the enabling technology for DirecTV. Previously, you could only send one clear video signal through a satellite transponder. With digital compression, we can send up to eight video signals per satellite transponder. So with only two satellites in orbit at one location, we'll be able to have 150 channels of programming, and again, all available through a small 18-inch fixed satellite dish. What the consumer will see is a crystal clear picture, close to laser disc. They'll get CD quality sound. There'll be this innovative on-screen menu that'll be transmitted as well so they can sort through the programs. Um, so it's really gonna be a whole new experience for the consumer. In addition to video, we'll be able to deliver data services such as stock market reports, weather reports. Uh, potentially, we can download computer software to a, a storage device, games. It just opens up the whole world of digital transmission, which means computer data, possibly interactive services down the road. Um, so this is a, a whole new world we're entering into and all available through this small 18-inch satellite dish. Uh, digital compression. <coughs> for the industry turns a uh, 32 transponder business into a 100 to 200 channel business and for us personally it turns a 5 transponder business into a 25 some channel business. Uh, clearly the uh, economics are very different if you're not in the digital compressed environment. Cable services which use satellites to distribute signals to community cable operators also intend to embrace the new compression technology. More than 53 million cable TV households are scheduled to switch to digital cable converter boxes before the end of the decade. The telephone companies are field testing compression systems which can transmit video over regular twisted pair telephone lines. Once operational systems are introduced, consumers will be able to retrieve a tremendous variety of stored services through the telephone network. In this sense, we will become our own TV programmers. One of the most exciting trends uh, in this decade is the um, apparent ability of the um, telephone company to get into the video broadcasting business. And I'm speaking here particularly about on-demand services that uh, various telephone companies are experimenting with for uh, provision to the home. Uh, S Compression Labs has provided the first uh, MPEG-based uh, set-top receivers to Bell Atlantic for a trial which is now beginning uh, in the Washington, D.C. area, uh, in which uh, video is actually provided to the home over twisted pairs. This is uh, a revolutionary service which uh, 
was not even envisioned uh, a few years ago, uh, particularly over copper wire. But the service is actually being trialed at this time, and I think points the way toward an entire, entirely new sector of the business that uh, has never been seen before. In particular, uh, companies such as Bell Atlantic and, of course, the other uh, regional uh, former Bell operating properties um, are all looking at the provision of such services, and they expect over the next several years to approach this as a new technology which provides a new revenue source in their businesses. So um, it's something that, um, as the technology develops, will start to appear in our homes and will be visible to the American consumer directly. It allows a, a tremendous variety of stored services to be retrieved uh, through the telephone network so that a user can obtain a particular movie or a particular uh, past sporting event or a particular uh, stored news commentary or can uh, enter into uh, all forms of, of catalog sales and merchandising uh, just by sitting in front of, of his or her TV set with a remote control. So this represents a video outlet to the home which with its high degree of interactivity uh, is something that we've not had before in the industry. Um, the system is perfectly capable of operating on a real-time basis as well, but of course the two-way interactivity aspect is based primarily on the ability to store compressed images because such a tremendous variety of them can be uh, put on a server and held for essentially an infinite period of time until someone wants to purchase them. Compression Labs also provides AT&T with the technology that allows the AT&T video phone to transmit video over standard telephone lines. Compression is the key in our evolution from passive to interactive viewing. For example, a subscriber can call and order one of thousands of different movies, previously aired news broadcasts, or sports events or even scan through video catalogs to place orders for merchandise. Entertainment television isn't the only area in which digital video compression is having an impact. The technology is already playing a major role in the workplace. Moderately priced desktop video conferencing systems now make it possible for individuals to participate Hi, Susie, in important corporate meetings and training seminars, all without leaving their computer workstations. This is the Cameo personal video system. Cameo consists of the camera that sits on top of the monitor, the codec, which is our core technology that takes the video signal, digitizes it, and sends it out over the telephone lines and the software package. Compression Labs will also bundle in the network card, either an ISDN card or a Switch 56 card that fits inside the computer. We also use a standard analog telephone to complete the hardware that you need. To make a call, all I have to do is go up into the speed dial where I've loaded the numbers that I most often call. To load a number, I would just choose set speed dial. I'd put the person name here the audio number and the video number, click OK. In this case, I'm going to call Susie by highlighting Susie's location. You see I get an on-screen message to tell me what I'm doing. And we have now audio and video hooked up to Susie. Hi, Susie. How are you today? Fine, Lou. How are you? I'm doing real well. It's nice to see you. Uh, what I'd like to do is uh, go ahead with the video conference. The power of video conferencing on the computer is not only the ability to talk with one another, but also the ability to send and receive files, images, even video through an auxiliary video port that we have here. Lastly, I have a high resolution document image preview. And as you can see, when I click this, the camera changes to the high resolution graphics stand I have next to the product and allows me to preview an image, take a picture of it, and now this is a graphic or uh, picture 
which I can send over to the remote side for them to take a look at. I can do that simply by going up to the menu and sending picture. And now Susie on the other end is getting an acknowledgement that a graphic is coming over. And she now has this image sitting on her desktop. Susie, all this is is simply uh, uh, Compression Lab's view of the market by how much bandwidth each of the products take. And as you can see in the, lo the lowest uh, part of that uh, image, personal video conferencing takes up 128 kilobits and below, typically. The other thing that uh, Cameo can do besides sending Susie just the picture of me, and again, you can see what you're sending to the other side by looking at the picture in picture. I could send her a live uh, video of what's ever connected to the second video input here. So if I wanted to change the main camera from the Cameo camera to the auxiliary camera, I'd go up and select auxiliary video input. And as you can see here, now uh, Susie is seeing live what is under my auxiliary high resolution graphics stamp. Multimedia libraries on CD-ROM discs also are available, giving researchers rapid access to a wide variety of video, text, pictures, and other graphic materials. Educational institutions and large businesses also are finding it cost-effective to establish distance learning classrooms, which are distributed over wide areas either by satellite Live. or local area networks. Currently, we're looking at the Spectrum Saver product line, demonstrating various transmission capabilities in front of you. Currently, here's a 3.3 broadcast, which is delivering educational video for Ball State University, part of the IHATS educational network. Moving on over, we'll see uh, the Westcott Communication Network, which is delivering educational programming material for uh, long-term health care networks. These two demonstrations here show you a 3.3 megabit, which is fine for uh, distant learning applications. We have slow motion, uh, very little movement inside the image there. Whereas in the 6.6 .6 megabit transmission range, you have the capabilities of handling high motion to deliver entertainment quality video. The current applications of the Spectrum Saver have come from using in horse racing, distant learning applications, as well as satellite news gathering. We're delivering uh, Spectrum Saver products into South America via uh, our distributor Keytech, as well as delivering systems into uh, the Southeast Asia. Uh, the Spectrum Saver is capable of broadcasting in NTSC, as well as PAL. Digital video compression offers several distinct advantages over analog transmission systems. Compression can be used for many applications regardless of the transmission format. Multiple TV services can easily be integrated into a unified signal. This gives service providers a convenient way to process subscription requests, deliver TV guides, and other information services. Digital video compression will also provide services with a high level of encryption security to prevent unauthorized reception. Video with stereo sound, auxiliary audio services, text, and data can be integrated into a single unified transmission. What's more, sophisticated error correction techniques can be used to produce pictures free of ghosting, snow, and other interference that often plague analog broadcasts. In a direct sense, the encryption and the use of MPEG are not connected. However, uh, the fact that MPEG is a digital standard uh, allows us to have extremely sophisticated encryption, which could never have been put together for analog systems. When used for satellite applications, digital video compression lowers the cost and complexity of networks because less power is required at both satellite uplink and downlink sites. Digital receive-only satellite antennas, therefore, can be less expensive and much smaller in diameter. In, in PAS-1, um, compression was expediency for us in that there was no other way to carry a single analog carrier um, once we had reached um, full, cell, full cell. So we used compression to maximize what was left of this bandwidth and power to carry additional channels. 
and uh, the acceptance in South America has, has been very good. And for cable last mile distribution, the system works very well. Um, there are a num number of other markets that compression needs to address, but in terms of distribution for cable or direct to home services, the quality is sufficiently good enough now, uh, and that's been validated by a number of other compression systems being installed in Europe, the US, and, uh, and in Central America. So we see compression um, as being a real benefit for the industry. Uh, it maximizes the use of satellite transponders carrying multiple channels. It, it lowers the per, per channel or per unit cost for the programmer, mm -hmm. um, which um, in and of itself you would think would intimidate a satellite carrier because uh, that presumes that there's more customers to fill up the additional channels. Uh, the simple fact is we believe that to be true that the ability to program a satellite not just with 24 channels of video but perhaps 50 or 100 or 200 uh, creates a demand for that satellite to set it as a, as a, as a, as a hot bird or as a, as a primary program distribution means uh, and it allows the individual channels to be priced more uh, affordably for the smaller program, the niche programmer and that's where we see compression heading. <music>
MPEG-1 currently is used by CD-ROM computer storage devices, which operate at a bitrate of 1.5 megabits per second. MPEG-1 also can accommodate the storage and transmission of video at higher data rates. MPEG-1 was not designed to transmit interlaced video signals. However, MPEG-1 can process interlaced video by first converting it to progressive scan video at half the normal field rate. Early digital video compression systems developed by Compression Labs and others have used a modified form of MPEG-1 to develop satellite distribution systems now used by business and broadcast customers around the world. In 1994, the MPEG committee finalized its criteria for a new MPEG-2 standard governing interlaced video applications. With MPEG-2, the resolution of the compressed video has been dramatically increased. Bitstream rates of up to 40 megabits per second also are possible, fast enough to accommodate a high-definition television picture. Well, the MPEG standard, and particularly MPEG-2, as, as the newest version of that standard, is, in my view, critical to uh, the development of the industry worldwide. The reason for that is that it's become very clear over the last several years with the many debates over proprietary compression schemes that what the industry wants is interoperability. What the industry wants is the ability to compress material and then use it again in a different system uh, in another part of the network. And so the call from the industry is let's have some kind of a standard so that we can have compatibility across a wide variety of platforms, whether they be video dial tone, satellite broadcast, or computer. And let's have that material interchange among those platforms. And that's what the MPEG-2 standard allows us to do. MPEG-2 compression dramatically reduces the number of bits per second which actually need to be transmitted. This is accomplished in four ways through pre-processing, temporal prediction, motion compensation, and coding. Through pre-processing, video information which is not essential to human visual perception is filtered out. Early studies of human perception have established how individual components of a video signal must be transmitted in order to maintain fidelity with the original image. For example, lower frequency video information is more perceptible to the human eye and therefore is more critical than the higher frequency information. The assignment of bits can be prioritized at any given moment according to which blocks need them the most to maintain the maximum perceptible image fidelity. Video sequences are highly correlated in time, with each frame in a sequence quite similar to both the preceding and following frames. It is therefore unnecessary to resend the parts of the image in which no elements have changed. The basic unit used for motion compensated prediction is called a macro block. A macro block consists of four 8 by 8 blocks of pixels containing the luminance or brightness data and two corresponding 8x8 eight eight blocks of chrominance, or color data. The encoder economizes on bandwidth by instructing the receiver to recall a previous frame's unchanged macro blocks from a buffer storage circuit and reinsert them into one or more subsequent frames. This requires substantially less information, or bandwidth, than sending all frames in their entirety. Motion compensation is used to compute the direction and speed of moving objects within the video image. All macro blocks are scanned to identify those portions which will not change position. Predictor blocks also are identified, with their position and direction of motion noted. Only the relatively small difference, called the motion compensation residual, between each predictor block and the affected current block is sent to the receiver. 
If all of these differences are communicated directly to the receiver, then no distortions or artifacts will be visible in the displayed image. Artifacts will be introduced whenever there is an insufficient number of bits available to communicate essential image information and rapid motion changes from one frame to the next. In this case, it is a trade-off between bit rate and image fidelity. MPEG accurately predicts where a moving object should appear in each succeeding frame using a very small number of bits. Moving, yet relatively unchanging objects are reduced to a mathematical shorthand equivalent of take the same object from the initial frame and move it three macro blocks to screen right for the next frame. Objects which change shape and move at the same time or multiple objects which are moving in different directions at different rates do not compress as easily. These objects therefore require a larger assignment of capacity in the bit stream. Whenever major scene changes occur, the encoder must instruct the receiver to dump the blocks from the previous frame stored in the receiver's frame buffer and transmit an entire set of new blocks. The frame being coded is predicted from previously coded frames. The difference between frames is transformed using a mathematical algorithm called the discrete cosine transform or DCT. The DCT can reorganize digital blocks of pixels into an even more compact form. Each macro block is first divided into four sub-blocks of 8 by 8 pixels for spatial compression within individual frames. The DCT algorithm converts these sub-blocks from a spatial domain into equivalent numbers in a frequency domain that can be transmitted more quickly. The DCT views the 8x8 block of picture information as a varying signal that can be approximated by a collection of 64 cosine functions. Each cosine value is associated with a DCT coefficient, which represents a different frequency component. Quantization takes these frequency coefficients and converts them to more compact codes, representative numbers which take less bits to send. The encoder accomplishes this by searching an internal codebook, a collection or index of possible representative numbers, and then selecting the code word that best matches the original set of frequency coefficients. Quantization approximates the original image in a subjectively acceptable way by rounding off all values within a range of limits to the same value. In 1950, Dr. David Huffman developed a unique coding system for compression. With Huffman coding, Relatively probable messages are assigned short numerical sequences, while relatively improbable messages are assigned long numerical sequences, resulting in a data compression factor of two. This coding is often compared to Morse code, which effectively represents alphabetic and related symbols by signals of varying lengths. The key is to use shorter codes for the things that are more likely to happen. The shortest code in the Morse system is a single dot, which represents the letter E, the most frequently used letter in most text. Longer combinations of symbols, dots, and dashes are for letters like Q, X, and Z that are not used as frequently. Therefore, the idea of variable length coding has been around for a long time. Dr. Huffman used this concept to develop the best variable length code to work under very general circumstances. Music 
MPEG provides for three different types of video frames which can be coded into a digital bitstream. The first frame in any video segment is called an intraframe or iframe. The iframe is coded using only information presented within itself. No reference is made to other frames within the digital bitstream. I-frames occur on an average of one out of every 10 to 15 frames, or whenever there is a scene change. MPEG uses the I-frames as a reference for predicting one or more subsequent frames. P-frames are predicted frames with reference to information presented in the nearest preceding I or P-frame. Each P-frame also serves as a reference for future P-frames. B-frames are bi-directional frames that are coded using motion-compensated prediction from the nearest preceding I or P-frame and the nearest following I or P-frame. The sum of the bits assigned to the I, P, and B-frames cannot exceed the allocated transmission speed in any given second. Not all MPEG-2 systems use B-frames. Those systems which do employ B-frames achieve a more efficient level of compression by up to 15 to 20 percent. Less data, therefore, is needed to achieve the same video quality. Decoders using B-frames, however, must have a second frame buffer. This adds to the cost of the total system. Um, the MPEG video compression uh, decision, I think, is reasonable except for one area which we continue to debate, which is this issue of B-frames, as to whether it is required or not, in that it adds cost to the decoder box. Um, but other than that, we are effectively MPEG-2 video compliant. Compression is very much like uh, what everybody's used to in Name That Tune. It's how many notes do you need to be able to tell what the song is. At eight notes, most everyone can guess what the song is. But if you only have one or two notes, it's very difficult. If in the B-frame implementation, you only need the one or two notes to be able to accurately predict what that tune happens to be. That's the advantage of compression. In order to support the use of B-frames, the encoder does not transmit the frames in display order. Instead, the encoder holds many frames in its buffer, figures out the best pictures to use for I and P frames, and then codes them out of order. Real-time encoders have a finite amount of time in order to make encoding decisions. Some compromises, therefore, must be made, either allowing more picture artifacts or using a higher data rate for the transmission. Non-real-time encoders for movies and other taped material do not suffer from these time constraints. The encoder can slow down and take its time when processing the image to select the best possible method of encoding. This results in a lower data rate for the same quality picture. Live sports and other live action material also require a higher data rate. More bits per second are required to transmit complex, rapid motion changes without introducing high levels of distortion. Different data rates will be used by the MPEG-2 video encoder depending on the nature of the video source material to be encoded. The first clip we'll be showing is a sports clip which will be done at a high data rate of around 8 megabits. We use a resolution of 704 by 480 for NTSC or 704 by 576 for 625 line power material. This will be done for high quality sports, uh, fast motion type applications. The resolution uh, is full CCIR 601 which has the 422 sampling and is used for broadcast to contribution links for retransmission. This will be used throughout the industry as we move on into the MPEG-2 and we have the new uh, MPEG-2 algorithms as they continually evolve. The next clip will be a 544 by either 480 or 576 
with vertical resolution. The data rates that will be ran at this resolution will be between five and seven and a half megabits, depending on the application and the quality you would like. The applications will be for redistribution, and again, at these data rates, you can handle high-speed sports, good general entertainment quality, and this will be good for any type of uh, home distribution type system where you want full luminance resolution. The next cut will be 352 by 480 or 576. The luminance resolution on this is about two and a half megahertz, and this is good for general entertainment, news, document, documentaries, and all, all types of information that you do not want to give full resolution to. Uh, a number of the movies that are made for TV that are 30 frame and 25 frame will use the 352 by 480 or 576. The data rate on this will run anywhere between two and a half up to six megabits, depending again on how good of quality that you want for each application. The last resolution is 352 by either 240 or 288. It's basically half resolution in the vertical domain. These are the resolutions that will be used for cable distribution, for film-based material only, for 24-frame based material. This type of movie material will be passed at data rates sub 2 megabits and will be used for the near video on demand applications throughout the industry. Once you get into the digital domain, you end up with a tremendous amount of flexibility or the potential to have this flexibility in the newest generation of compression systems that various equipment manufacturers are talking about you can basically mix and match different types of services in the same multiplex whereby a customer with one antenna can receive radio services tv services um, different types of multimedia services all from potentially one box if that box is designed correctly um, the other issue that is very, very big in all of this is that um, because of the flexibility of all of the compression systems and the way that all of these bits get multiplexed together to get a digital pipe into the customer's homes, the programmer also has a tremendous amount of flexibility in launching new types of services. Virtual channels is a concept whereby the customer or the end consumer does not really know which transponder or which satellite they have to be watching at any time to receive a specific service. They purchase services and, and subscribe to services based on content. For example, uh, a programmer could have a John Wayne movie channel that a consumer subscribes to because he happens to be a John Wayne fan. And that movie could be on one transponder one day and on another transponder another day. And the IRD has the intelligence to know where the John Wayne channel is in that network and automatically tunes to the John Wayne channel when the customer selects it. Scientific Atlanta has developed a system that is very user friendly to whoever is actually operating the system. Now there are some fixed bandwidths to the system. There is only a fixed amount of data capacity that you can get into a given satellite transponder. But within that overall fixed capacity, the programmer or whoever is actually operating the system has the capability simply through a software package which we have designed to go in and indicate that channel 1, for instance, from 8 p.m. till 10 p.m. is going to be a basketball game and from 10 p.m. till 1 a.m. is going to be a movie. And what the programmer can do is not only indicate uh, within the system when the various programs need to come on, but he can also program the system such that he is using much greater bandwidth for the basketball game, which is very high motion, and then can take it down to a lower bit rate automatically within the computer system for the movie, and then reallocate those bits perhaps to another basketball game, which may be showing on channel five, which is in the same transponder. So the system is extremely flexible for the operator. And we have already seen people like Turner Broadcasting, for instance. They have TNT, which does basketball. They have TBS, um, CNN. 
they can put all of those into a transponder and then mix and match the bit rates as required amongst those services. And the same is true for programmers worldwide. Compatibility between various MPEG-2 systems, unfortunately, is limited. The MPEG-2 standard should be regarded as a framework for designers rather than as a specific blueprint. It does not define how encoding decisions should be accomplished. Compatibility is important from the marketplace standpoint simply because it means that you are not reliant upon a single manufacturer for a product. When you have a monopoly situation, whether it be in satellite broadcasting or anything, that monopoly provider has a tendency to set prices. They can dictate the terms by which you are going to purchase the equipment. And certainly the experiences that we have seen in the United States indicate that programmers are not willing to get into a monopolistic situation again. Mm -hmm. Compatibility and interoperability between manufacturers who use the MPEG-2 standard will potentially allow programmers to go to various manufacturers to purchase the equipment and you won't have a single player who is able to dominate the market. MPEG does specify what an MPEG compliant bitstream must look like. However, manufacturers intend to use proprietary designs based on their perception of what their customers may want. Some of the trade-offs include picture quality versus transmission rate, live versus tape conversion, and cost of manufacture versus system performance. Differences between various system encryption methods also will keep MPEG-2 from becoming a true universal standard. However, interoperability is one major benefit derived from this new technology. The exchange of program materials on a worldwide basis should become a non-issue for broadcasters who in the past have had to convert from one video standard to another before being able to use a program. The convergence of so many different forms of media into a single worldwide format is the exciting part because you're going to have so many efficiencies that you're going to have much more programming which will be attractive to more consumers that they are willing to pay for this product. It's going to offer a more variety, more choice in a more efficient manner which will have a happier consumer and therefore you know, sell more products. Changing from um, one uh, composite standard to another such as from NTSC to CCAM or PAL to NTSC or any of the other connections will be improved somewhat by the MPEG standard, although uh, conversion issues will still exist. Uh, for, for example, the picture format uh, and the number of lines uh, will still be an issue with PAL versus uh, NTSC versus other formats. However, uh, generally speaking, the MPEG uh, format takes away most of the impediments of interoperability. As far as HDTV is concerned, uh, uh, our participation in the ATRC and work in the, uh, in the early stages of HDTV have been in the MPEG area, and uh, it's our belief that the Grand Alliance will be largely MPEG oriented, although uh, there are some differences between the HDTV Grand Alliance standard and the pure MPEG-2 document. Those may be washed out or not in the near future, depending on the actions of the Grand Alliance. But in any case, uh, it's an MPEG-based system, and uh, that will certainly uh, do much to ease conversion among formats. I think it's becoming very important, and one of the ways in which we have seen that has been that every international programmer everyone internationally who is looking to try to implement new digital video services, their number one requirement is that it be MPEG-2 compatible. And I believe what they are seeing is not so much the fact that, well, everyone else in the world is going MPEG-2, we need to do the same thing. It's the fact that they are also seeing that, hey, in the future, if I want to get video direct from a D1 machine, I'm going to be compatible with it. If I want to receive compressed video from another programmer to rebroadcast, if I'm MPEG-2 and he's MPEG-2, I'm going to be able to receive that without a lot of extra equipment to decode it and decompress it and then recompress it 
back into the standard that I'm using. Mm -hmm. And I think it's the future compatibility and the, the promise of what the future holds for what programmers can do that is leading them to look to MPEG-2 as a savior, so to speak. They're not going to have to worry about NTSC to PAL conversions or SACAM to PAL conversions anymore. It's going to be a seamless process, which should be less expensive for them in the long run. Programmers can compress their program material so that it can be stored, transported, and reused by any MPEG-2-based system without further conversion. What's more, the similarities between MPEG-1 and MPEG-2 allow programmers to transmit previously compressed MPEG-1 programs through MPEG-2 compliance systems without further conversion. A broadcaster has the advantage under MPEG-1 and 2 that uh, he can take material that has been pre-compressed from almost any source, as long as it's been uh, correctly uh, compressed in the MPEG format. And even if it's MPEG-1, he can broadcast it through an MPEG-2 system. Uh, the receivers and the receiver chips that he'll be broadcasting to will be capable of decoding a good picture from that uh, compressed broadcast, uh, no matter where it was compressed or who compressed it. The MPEG-2 is a watershed event in that it is the digital highway of the future. It allows the uh, protocols so that you're able to use MPEG-1, H.261, uh, and many other sources of media to be able to be broadcast from a single source all the way through the various distribution systems to the end consumer with the least amount of interference and the least cost. Uh, this is, in essence, what the MPEG-2 world wants to be. You have a number of manufacturers, of uh, distributors, and programmers who want to efficiently serve the consumer market. The driving force in MPEG is that you have uh, standards that reduce your risk of producing product that will become obsolete because of all the so-called standards that are in the marketplace. And that's what MPEG-2 does. It assures a digital highway for the future. The International Standards Organization has established an open systems interconnection model to foster compatibility between various communication networks, including those using MPEG compression. The OSI model defines the functions, services, and protocols involved in the communication process. Each message relayed through a communication system using the OSI model passes downward during transmission or upward during reception through each layer. The application layer serves as the link between communication systems and the outside world. The presentation layer is responsible for delivering the message in a form that the receiving system can understand and access. MPEG features flexible conversion between various video standards and formats, including PAL, NTSC, widescreen, and HDTV. The session layer manages the message assembly, buffering, and information exchange. It also provides for the flexible integration of video, audio, text, voice, and data. The transport layer controls the end-to-end -end delivery of data, including the multiplexing of multiple messages. It also governs interoperability between the various cable, broadcast, and satellite transmission standards. The network layer routes communications through network resources. The data link layer formats and synchronizes the message. It includes error control and protocols which break up the data bitstream into sequential frames. The physical layer is the interface to the transmission medium. It includes mechanical and electrical interconnections. MPEG has uh, a number of layers that you hear discussed in the industry, and it's very important to understand uh, what their functions are. Uh, at first blush, people tend to think of MPEG as a video compression standard, which it is. However, MPEG also includes an audio standard or standards, and it includes a standard for multiplexing the video, audio, and user data together. And it turns out that that particular layer, which is called the transport layer in MPEG-2, is of considerable importance because it is the layer which 
carries the information so the receiver can determine what services uh, of an MPEG nature are carried in a particular bit stream. So without the transport layer, uh, it's uh, much more difficult to have interoperability, and that's the goal of the MPEG-2 standard. Transport layer is simply the way that the bits are multiplexed together so that audio, video, and user data can be taken apart easily at the receiver. Two different transmission modes are used to deliver MPEG compressed programming via satellite. Single channel per carrier or SCPC signals have their own independent carriers and frequency assignments within the bandwidth of a given satellite transponder. MPEG program services using SCPC can uplink their programming from different physical locations while sharing the same transponder. SCPC typically is used for program exchanges, satellite news gathering applications, business and educational networks, or any other part-time service which does not need dedicated 24-hour service. Uh, Spectrum Saver utilizes an SCPC type broadcast. This means that you're able to deliver your programming material from multiple locations, whereas in the past you had to bring your source material to one central location and then deliver that to an uplink facility who would mix it together with their other materials that they're broadcasting. This, for an educational marketplace, allows you to uh, originate your source material at any one of your uplink sites uh, that is located at the university and to deliver it throughout the United States. For the part-time services, we needed an SCPC type of system which would allow for origination from other points beyond my gateway to South America for events within South America. Um, the compromise there is it's not the most efficient loading on a satellite, so dish sizes or the amount of power uh, used for uh, reception of the signal is not optimal. Mm -hmm. In the case of the DigiCypher service, it's, a, it's an MCPC where we multiplex six individual video channels into one carrier consuming about 24 megahertz of satellite bandwidth, uh, nominally one, one normal transponder which is used to maximize the transponder and allow multiple programmers access through the same system. Again, an individual receiver is needed for each program channel, but the, uh, the overall uh, efficiencies of the system in terms of power on the satellite and other advantages like multiplexing, or mm -hmm. um, statistical multiplexing, where the individual channels are combined in a way that allows the channel, the individual channel that requires uh, more motion compensation for the particular passage of video mm -hmm. can borrow from the other channels in the system to provide on-demand kind of um, um, additional capacity for, for motion compensation. Multiple channel per carrier or MCPC transmissions contain two or more program services which are multiplexed into a single unified signal. Networks using MCPC can share the same conditional access and forward error correction systems. This economizes on the overall bandwidth and transmission speed requirements for these networks. What's more, programmers can dynamically assign capacity within the multiplex, providing additional bits to a live sports broadcast and fewer bits to a talking head infomercial. At the conclusion of the sports event, excess bits could then be reassigned to another service within the multiplex. If a pay-per-view program generates an unusually high number of orders, bits can be reallocated for decoder authorization. This will minimize the time between the customer placing an order for a program and their decoder being turned on. The main disadvantage of MCPC is that all program services must be uplinked from the same physical location. For example, a 21.5 megabit per second multiplex might include 2 to 10 standard video services, 20 audio channels, text at 45 pages per second, 5 19.2 kilobit per second data channels, and conditional access addressing to millions of decoders. 
if you have a, an IRD or an integrated receiver decoder, which has a, a fair amount of computing power, you can now program the receiver to monitor what you are watching and the types of programs you are watching and actually make suggestions. Mm -hmm. um, in the 500 channel environment, mm -hmm. there's not enough time to flip through all the channels. Even today's program guides, people are questioning uh, whether they will be sufficient to navigate through 500 channels. It turns out that the analog receivers that are in the field today are not, um, it's not possible to upgrade those receivers to digital compression. So what digital compression does mean is that when there are sufficient services that are attractive enough to the consumer, the consumer will need to purchase a new receiver. Mm -hmm. The systems have been designed in such a way that the antennas and the block converters, the LNBs, mm -hmm. will not need to be replaced. So therefore, it minimizes the impact on the consumer. Um, on the installer, the installer would install a digital compression system in much the same way on the, on the, con on the receiver side, in much the same way that they would an analog system. Digital compression works in a slightly different way than analog transmission. Digital compression, uh, with the error correction that people are using today, you either get a perfect picture or you get very little picture, as in not watchable. Um, in C-band satellite transmission, this is a very beneficial thing because there is very little uh, rain fade during uh, storms. And therefore, you can conceivably have smaller antennas receiving digital compression signals um, <clears throat> than you could having analog signals while still increasing the capacity of channels by huge factors, over 10. So therefore, it allows the programmer to use lower-powered satellites or medium-powered satellites to simulate higher-powered ones by trading channel capacity for signal-to-noise ratio. TVRO technicians will need to make changes in their procedures when installing MPEG-based direct-to-home satellite TV systems. With analog satellite TV, even very weak signals can be detected by viewing a satellite TV monitor while adjusting the antenna. When receiving a very weak signal, the first evidence of video is the appearance of sync, then black and white pictures, and finally color. With digital satellite TV, however, weak signals will appear to be noise. The receiver will not display a picture until sufficient signal is reaching the antenna. Likewise, when it begins to rain and the digital KU band signal starts to fade down, the picture remains perfect. Then suddenly, it completely disappears. In this sense, reception is like a light switch, either on or off. Installers of digital satellite TV systems will have to rely on antenna tuning meters or portable spectrum analyzers to peak antenna performance. The new age of digital video compression is a major revolution that is dramatically altering our global telecommunication infrastructure. Narrowcasting, geared to the specific needs of relatively small audiences, represents one major benefit of this exciting new technology. Another major benefit is greater access to mainstream entertainment channels via a new digital pipeline into our homes including superior quality widescreen and high-definition television. By the turn of the century, we will look back at the era of analog TV broadcasting with a nostalgia normally reserved for Kitty Hawk and the Model T. For Shelburne Films, this is Mark Long.